Welcome, Michigan bankers. Thank you so much for joining today. I am Jill Verscher with the MBA Service Corporation, and we are co-sponsoring today with our endorsed partner, Harlan Clark. We feel very privileged to have um, Robert Ropars, Sharon Horsch, and Ann Cox with us today. Um, just a few maintenance types uh, items to bring up. Uh, we would love to address questions with you at the end of Robert's presentation. Feel free to send in your questions to me on chat or in the Q&A and we'll pull those all together and um, send them to Robert or say them to Robert in the end. Um, also, this is being recorded and we will share the recording with you by the end of the week. So um, we very much appreciate you being here today. Hope that um, all's going well in December. I know that's a busy month. So, uh, so without further ado, I would love to introduce Robert Ropars. He is a digital, digital solutions advisor with Harlan Clark for the past 10 years experience is in the financial service industry um, and digital strategy and solutions. He supports the sales teams all across the entire country, sharing best practices, digital solutions as he is with you today to help all of Harlan Clark's clients achieve their goals, leveraging experience in email marketing brand awareness, and online advertising. As I mentioned, Sharon Horsch and Ann Cox are here as well, and we are really looking forward to, uh, to working with you today. So Robert, please, we'd love to have you with us. And let's see, here we go. All right, uh, thanks, Jill. I really appreciate uh, the invitation and being able to join everybody today. Uh, looking forward to going through some things with you guys, which I hope you'll find valuable. And, and uh, as Jill said, as we approach the uh, end of the year here, some things to think about from um, the kind of short term, but more going into looking at the long term perspective. Uh, but I wanted to share current trends that we're seeing going on in the uh, banking industry and how those might be impacting you guys. Uh, and Jill, you want to move to the next slide? Having trouble getting there. Just one moment. Oh, sure. Sorry so, about that, guys. Oh, that's quite all right. Uh, so, uh, as we're um, moving and starting into the flow today, uh, from an agenda perspective, I can share that we're going to be talking about how changes that HUD leveraging the FHA has impacted lending related digital advertising. So some things that you may be aware of, uh, but just in case you're not, uh, some things have been happening in the last uh, 12 uh, to 18 months that impact digital advertising uh, specifically for lending related activities. And then in addition, obviously this year has been a major impact by COVID-19. And so one of the things we wanted to share was some of the things that we've seen across this year of uh, change and turbulence that have been effective strategies that financial institutions have taken and specifically around geofencing and geotargeting. Uh, consumer digital content consumption has vastly changed this year and so there's some opportunities there for uh, financial institutions and looking at Gen Y and Gen Z I had done some prior uh, studies and uh, webinars last year about them and of course wanted to update how things have changed coming into this year as obviously the pandemic has affected every generation but as many clients I talked to across the country are so uh, interested in focusing on ac acquiring more of those two generations uh, so that'd be interesting to share some of those things so again look forward to sharing the, the uh, information and then going into some questions at the end. So starting out looking at uh, HUD and how they've been very aggressively uh, going after uh, several um, 
providers of digital advertising, specifically Facebook and Google. So even though this has been uh, during the last four years, has been a little bit lower in terms of prior years, in terms of regulation and regulatory issues and challenges. One thing that HUD did not uh, shy away from was going after both Facebook and Google uh, for uh, their targeting practices. So if we move to the next slide, Jill. Um, not going to read all of this out loud because I'm sure most of you know all this already by heart, I'm sure. Um, but one of the things that uh, we're talking about here, obviously, the Fair Housing Act is specifically when you talk about targeting digital marketing it applies to those uh, facets which they consider discriminatory practices. Uh, so again, this impacts the availability of providing lending to uh, help people acquire housing. And so these have been well known for some time. They've obviously been in law for a long time. But one of the things that had transpired is that both Facebook and Google in their advertising platforms had opened up rather broadly the targeting capabilities, which in general terms for marketing and advertising wouldn't necessarily always be an issue. But when applied specifically in the financial space towards lending, would actually cause uh, significant issues. So HUD did take action on this. So we wanted to start out with a quick question here before we dive in. How many of you have used Google or Facebook for any lending related ads in the past two years? So this is kind of a yes or no top level question. Have you tried it? So this would be uh, Google ads, uh, it's kind of paid search, pay-per-click or Facebook advertising. Okay, they're coming in. All right. Oh, okay. About uh, a little more than half have uh, given it a try, it looks like, but um, uh, interesting. All right. Very cool. So moving right in. So if you're not aware, um, HUD went after Facebook last year. Uh, obviously, they've been working on for some time, but uh, they really uh, kind of came to a head if we uh, move to the next slide, Jill. Um, they had uh, gone after Facebook specifically about the fact that they had so many different in, in excess of 5,000 different ad targeting options. And so March of last year, they actually found them and charged them with violating and, and basically causing discriminatory practices. So uh, as a result, they changed their platform uh, pretty substantially last year. And so going forward, they removed a bunch of ad targeting options. So that was to help prevent misuse. Uh, and, sure, and certainly if you have uh, keep aware of the news, Facebook's constantly being uh, accused of allowing this or that or not allowing this or that. So they're facing a lot of challenges and potentially a breakup as well. Uh, but as you can see here, going uh, kind of above and beyond, one of the things that they took out was not just the, uh, some of the ad target options, but they've removed options that allow you to basically limit where people are seeing ads or who's seeing ads based on various attributes such as ethnicity or religion. And they're no longer allowing anyone or any company, so this could be personal advertising, small business or uh, larger companies to target housing, employment or credit ads by age, gender or zip code. Uh, so that'll come into play uh, as we talk more about uh, Google as well, why zip code kind of came into the mix here. Uh, so they have really created a situation where on the Facebook platform, you have a much uh, more limited scope, which means that your advertising is more general and hitting a more broad, uh, less targeted audience. Obviously, as we all know, we're trying to balance the uh, targeting and segmentation and response against things like this where there's a regulatory concern, but it's greatly changed things in the last year. So then we moved to Google. They then went after Google and they did not, um, go after Google uh, to the level of Facebook because F uh, Google responded very quickly to say, let's sit down and work this out kind of a thing. So this is sort of, uh, I don't say hot off the presses at this point, but it's still lukewarm. But as of October this year, they are now changing their ad policy as well, prohibiting things that impact a variety of things, but they also are taking out gender, age, parental status, marital status, and zip code again. 
And so part of this was to change the way advertisers are targeting their ads to avoid situations where you can target or exclude users based on those things. And even pulling in whether somebody's married or they've given off information that they're going to be married, their parental status, uh, and things were like bid adjustments that are made based on targeting factors. So all of those things are now no longer possible within the Google advertising network. Uh, again, part of their trying to come to the table and do above and beyond what was specifically being asked, but then to avoid further regulatory issues. So as we looked at that further on the next slide, one of the things that they uh, talked about is that you can still use browsing behavior. So you could still look, you know, one of the examples that we found was that if you were looking for people searching for student housing, potentially you could uh, put ads in front of them for a lending kind of offer, but not factoring age specifically. Uh, looking at interest will still be able to be targeted, but they obviously there's some nuance is to there. But the reason again, much like Facebook with zip codes is the HUD storyline that kind of flows through if you kind of read through all the articles is that basically they're looking at the history of zip codes, how they were created over time, how city planning has occurred over time, and then in many cases in uh, some cities that was used for redlining and gerrymandering. And so zip code targeting is basically being seen, at least in, uh, they're taking it to a very um, crucial level of saying that there's a potential that there's a, even if it's not intentional, there could be uh, unintentional systemic uh, division there that could be causing basically your digital ads to artificially cause this kind of segmentation. So it's big changes with both Facebook and Google. So of course, then the next question would be, well, what do we do about this or how do we handle this? So one of the strategies obviously working within the parameters that they've set there uh, is really all you can do for both Facebook and Google. But uh, one of the strategies that we found that works very well with our clients is something called dynamic radius. So working with an advertising platform that can deploy this kind of strategy, what this does is it does not look at specific zip codes. And instead of having that kind of static population view, it is looking around your branches, for example, and moving in a distance around it that's spread out, taking into account uh, your, your preferred criteria and obviously avoiding uh, ones that would be prohibited. But it basically looks across the geography, not really paying attention so much to zip codes, but focus more on what is the general population around your branches and then who's got this interest and proclivity for the thing that you're trying to promote in this case uh, we're talking about lending and so by doing this it also adjusts uh, day to day if you have the ability to take into account uh, changes in data and information uh, making sure it's updated so the key here is obviously balancing not just uh, finding the right people, but also um, not bombarding them and spamming them over and over and over. So uh, part of obviously any kind of uh, successful digital strategy will be you know, working uh, through the population of people who are actually engaged online, giving off those signals of interest and uh, showing the things that are matching what we're looking for in terms of targeting. And so uh, if we move to the next slide. That's really what the ultimate goal is. And really, as we talk to our clients and work with them to figure out best approaches, whether it's for lending or deposit or any other kind of strategy, we really wanna find the optimal way to reach and engage with uh, consumers so that when they're ready to engage, we know that and be able to balance again, kind of scale and precision against those FHA restrictions uh, so that your digital advertising is really getting the maximum attention, you're improving your brand and you're obviously achieving your ongoing KPIs. So from a lending related digital marketing perspective, all of this is, uh, these are things that are constantly evolving and we have to keep an eye on. So that's a lot of uh, the conversations I had over this year were around that. But, nowhere near as many conversations as around the impact of COVID-19. So as we know, COVID-19 uh, greatly impacted everybody in every industry and still continues to to this day and well into, well into the next year. Uh, so as we look at the types of businesses, obviously greatest impact, obviously restaurants and other uh, service related. And obviously the lockdowns we have have caused a lot of difficulties and challenges for both brands and consumers. Uh, so if we look at the next slide, really wanted to kind of summarize some of the things that interestingly, the financial uh, sector had 
a kind of a transformational shift this year. And it was, it, it, as I was kind of looking into this earlier this year for some of the conversations with clients, found quotes much like many like this uh, from 2013, American Banker, we're talking about how drive throughs basically had seen their day, they're done. People are moving to self-service channels, digital, um, really had altered the landscape and everyone was kind of, uh, much like email marketing and other things, every day is predicting, you know, this is it, it's all done, time to go. So the interesting thing is the very, th the very um, thing that most people were predicting was going away, ended up with the drive-throughs being something that actually was the one exception in this uh, time of difficulty with foot traffic and people not being able to go indoors or gather together. Uh, so as we move to the next slide, very big change just seven years later, of course, who could have predicted it, where as uh, banks began, clo and, uh, began closing their branches and the hours were changed, suddenly drive throughs became a thing again. I know I talked to many clients this year that were struggling with even <clears throat> maintaining, uh, having issues with local police and city officials because they had lines coming out you know, down the street because people suddenly were getting used to being in drive throughs again. So the interesting thing is that creates a opportunity for digital advertising in terms of geofencing and geotargeting. Because now you've got a situation where you know people are going to be, if you have uh, the ability to detect their presence digitally, that they're on your physical locations or near and at your, your properties. And they are obviously waiting in line. And we all know what we do when we wait in line, we get on our phones. So leveraging not just the online technology to put ads in front of people when they're uh, at home, on their tablet, their phone, uh, streaming channels on TV, those kinds of things. This is really capturing that real world, the other facet, which even though again, severely uh, hampered by COVID, it does open an opportunity. And on the next slide, we actually had a couple of different opportunities around this arise this year. So I wanted to share a real world example, uh, client out East, that was opening a new branch or planning to open a new branch on uh, the new year. And they wanted to talk about marketing. So obviously a lot of different uh, online options available to them. But one of the things we really got honed in on was leveraging uh, in this particular case where there's a lot of foot traffic, even uh, with COVID, leveraging that uh, real world perspective when someone's there, but then taking it to the next level, what about all the competitors nearby? So we can uh, take a look at a situation like this and come up with a strategy where we're not only helping you uh, market yourselves, but also potentially look at your competitors nearby. And when someone's on the uh, grounds or near that property, uh, trigger an ad on their mobile devices is a great strategy. So one, the next thing I wanted to ask is how many of you have used geofencing to target consumers at your branches or your competitors or both? Uh, just curious uh, how many people have tried geofencing, also known as geotargeting. And let's see here. Okay, very, very, a lot different here. So again, it's an interesting strategy. Had I would say this probably the last four or five months, uh, besides general conversations around uh, online strategy for digital advertising, this one was probably one of the more consistent things uh, that came up. So to that end, as we move to the next slide, that's really a goal and I don't foresee this changing. Um, I think there's going to be a long-term impact on consumers looking for alternate ways, which in the past, you know, purely meant digital banking, online banking, which is still gonna be a huge thing and still needs to advance. But there are many opportunities, whether we're on lockdown or opened up to take advantage of people naturally flowing through your physical locations and potentially your competitors and uh, these could also be ATMs, uh, loan offices, uh, anything like mortgage loan officers. So i uh, talked to some clients about uh, uh, auto dealerships, if you do auto lending. So there's a variety of things that if there's that physical real world place, 
ba basically leveraging a geofencing, geotargeting strategy, you can make those places live and interactive so that when someone's on their phone nearby, it'll actually create an ad that appears in front of them. And there's a lot of very cool technology out there that lets you do kind of interactive uh, ads so that it's not interrupting what they're doing, but if they engage with the ad, it suddenly fills their screen and they can do all kinds of things, click to call, click to get directions, uh, go to order something, uh, all those kind of things. So there's a lot of different things that can be done. So that would be something I definitely would recommend exploring. Then the other thing to take advantage of is content consumption. And here we're talking specifically about digital content, predominantly video, um, but I'm not gonna dive as, uh, into podcasts, but there's you know, all manner of digital media, but really specifically talking about video. So as I'm going through this, I want you to think about uh, if you're actively producing like YouTube videos, for example, or if you're doing any kind of commercials, uh, think about the kinds of stuff you're putting together and how effectively that can be leveraged, especially during these uh, changing times to get in front of consumers to expand your brand and uh, uh, really connect with people in an emotional way. Because I will say they've done a lot of studies that as people have moved into this digital space rapidly, especially in the banking world, surveys very recently have shown that there's a disconnect where people aren't feeling an emotional connection. So there's a little bit of a coldness, a utilitarian reaction to what we're doing uh, to serve people during this time. So this is a great way to work around that and provide that emotional context. So as we know, across the course of this year, uh, especially at the early part of the pandemic, uh, lockdowns and things like that, very logically and expected people were consuming a lot more content. They were stuck at home. Uh, they were um, beginning to uh, start to explore. Can we go back? Two slides, Jill, sorry. Um, starting to explore what uh, was available. And in particular, they were diving into content and consuming content a lot more. I think we're moving a little through the slides there, Jill. Um, might hit play. Um, uh, so one of the things that you know really stood out as we you know dug into where content consumption was going is that uh, during the early part of the uh, phase, content consumption skyrocketed, but during the summer, when people had the opportunity to get back outdoors, the interesting thing is, although content consumption for video information did decrease, it did not decrease to the level it had been prior to the uh, uh, start of the pandemic. And in fact, it remained significantly higher than it was previously. Uh, so there a lot of uh, people now have uh, the ability to stream and have capable uh, streaming capable homes and streaming video is now a huge portion of the amount of time people are consuming content. And as part of that, it's increasing and Nielsen is starting to really track this. And actually this next year, they're going to really be tracking uh, streaming versus regular as people are cutting the cords or never cords as they're called who never had cable. Uh, so one of the things that's happening is there was an expectation that people would be cutting back on bills during this time frame, which they did. Uh, and that included paid services because ironically at the same time uh, all of this was happening, many new channels and uh, things, you know, Disney Plus had launched last year, so they were already out there, but HBO Max, uh, Peacock, there's a, a series of networks have uh, joined up and what they found out was only 2% of adults were reducing it. And it kind of makes sense because people are stuck at home, they're trying to entertain their kids. So that was actually one place as people cut back on costs around their life, entertainment and streaming made a lot of sense for people to keep the family going during the summer. And even during the time when they could get back out, it was uh, still something they were really leveraging and uh, leaning on. And then because of obviously the chaotic year we've had for a variety of reasons, not just the pandemic, uh, if we move to the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, where people access content, the type of content that they're accessing uh, continues to increase. And uh, the one key factor I want to mention here is that over three quarters of US homes have at least one connected device. So the way people connect to content, the TVs can do it themselves, Blu-ray players, 
Xbox, PlayStation, so your video game consoles, um, and then boxes like Roku or Amazon Fire, uh, all of those different devices that let you connect to the internet, all of them have streaming channels with advertising built in. So the interesting thing is all of this has kind of come together and increased as people were already adopting all of this new technology, already starting to gravitate to all of this increasing streaming usage at the same point when they're now stuck inside and needing something to distract them from the real world. So one of the things that we've seen is that has basically exponentially increased the ability for uh, our clients to get in front of consumers and place ads that perhaps previously they just put on their YouTube channel and uh, hope for uh, people to discover and find, uh, maybe promote via some channel, but a lot of times just kind of fill up the YouTube channel and use that, but be able to take that same exact kind of content or commercials that you may have been running on cable and actually put it in front of people uh, on the digital connected TV platforms. So it's really changed the way both consumers are consuming content, but the way marketers are reaching them. And it's really creating a lot of increased diversity. And this is even before you get to the fact that uh, Elon Musk and um, uh, Bezos and others are starting to launch satellites to bring high-speed internet to rural areas. So as we move forward over the next few years, you're going to see an explosion of more people able to access high-speed content and internet than ever before. And so that just increases, again, this very cost-effective way to get in front of folks and expand, again, get that emotional content in front of people. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, I think I just had kind of a quick summary here, but I also wanted to mention that, you know, as you have all of these big streaming services out there, there are still plenty that have advertising built into them. But you can see that, you know, looking at April 2020, earlier this year, those big five streaming services were 83% of streaming hours. So that is huge and partly has to do again with smart TVs. And Google has now updated their streaming thing and they're a huge player right now. Um, very inexpensive, I think it's like $50. They built a whole nice interface and they uh, remote to go with it. So now you're gonna see them be a big competitor. So there's really a plethora of ways that people can access content and all of, all of them include things that have advertising that mixes in local with national. And that's important because one of the other pieces of all this as you sift through all the data from this year uh, on the next slide is local news. So one of the things that spiked this year and is remaining high, even as we kind of ride the ups and downs of the pandemic, is that adults and people of all ages really have started consuming local news like never before. And so that's another place where those local advertising and local commercials feed right into that perfectly. And so taking advantage of the change in viewing hours, uh, people trapped at home. So you've got the kind of captive eyes and captive audiences. And with everything going on, it's basically, and you can see on the graph there, the different things that obviously, I don't even think they mentioned, uh, they didn't even mention the election on there, which obviously that's been another piece of it. So we've kind of had three or four major things that have got people now in the habit of constantly checking, not just what's going on across the country, but what's going on in my neighborhood, what's going on locally. And that's where you guys, as you, you know, look at your footprints, that's where you live and that's where you're taking care of them is in that local footprint. Uh, so it's just kind of a natural fit to be feeding into all of this. So at the end of the day, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more again in a moment about the uh, Gen Y and Gen Z specifically, but when you look at anyone kind of 18 and over, higher, higher uh, degree of uh, streaming content, particularly local news, and not going back down to where it was before uh, the pandemic. So it's only going to go up from here. So uh, definitely an exponential increase. So we move to the next slide. Um, really it's, it's it's the messages and what we talk a lot with our clients is how do you then take things to the next level with your digital advertising how do you take perhaps videos like i said that you're already doing today for your youtube channel or other uh, medium and turn those into really great uh, streaming ads to capture people's attention, especially as uh, we'll talk about in a second when people are on multiple devices all the time, uh, especially as you skew to the younger generations. So there's a huge opportunity, uh, much like the geofencing and geotargeting, to take advantage of how this pandemic has accelerated consumer behavior and changed how they're 
interacting with each other in the world, but it opens up these doorways for new ways to interact with them as a brand. So then the last but not least section is probably, I'd say over the last few years, the majority, not the majority, but a good number of conversations have been around, how do we get millennials? How do we get them in the door? How do we attract them and keep them? What do they look like? Uh, so I've done a couple uh, talks over the years on this and uh, interactions with clients talking about it specifically, you know, strategies. And of course, Zen, Gen Z, the next generation coming right after that. Um, so. Last year, uh, so I want to share is com basically information that I had pulled together from last year, which I think will still resonate and then kind of update with where things are today. So I'm not gonna read all of this. Obviously you'll have uh, access to this uh, afterwards, but I wanted to point out a few key things about each of these generations. So Gen Y, uh, I think savvy but cautious is a great way to describe uh, this generation. A um, lot of purchasing power, uh, which, Again, we'll talk about the impact of COVID in a moment, but looking prior to this year, strong block of purchasing, uh, definitely seen as a group that doesn't like physical branches or banking and likes online tools. But if you read through all the studies, the one difference is they may not like branches, but they like knowing they're nearby. And then one difference for a millennial is they're very big on financial planning. They very much trust financial advisors. And that's the one exception generally to the rule of getting them in the door. They like that kind of stuff and they wanna be face to face with somebody, uh, obviously this year aside, but generally speaking. And of course, in the background of all of this, there was a lot of talk over the last few years about the, the great transfer of wealth coming from baby boomers, which Depending all different numbers, I, I saw everything uh, from 20 to 30 trillion dollars over the next 20 years. Uh, so possibly on the high end, 30 trillion dollars changing hands from baby boomers to Gen X predominantly, but a huge chunk possibly going straight to Y and Z uh, or thereabouts. Uh, so that's obviously been impacted. So we look today, uh, Gen Y a lot more living at home uh, than previously. Um, and it's particularly uh, those with uh, not yet a high school diploma more likely than those with to live in a larger family kind of situation kind of grouping together. So there's been a lot of uh, shift in, in it definitely breaks out compared, uh, you know, based on uh, level of educational uh, access where they've gotten to in life. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out is that when you have millennials with a bachelor's degree or higher, they're more likely than those with less education to live with a spouse and no child. So the, the trend towards having children later, marrying later continues. And again, I'm not gonna dig into all these different numbers here, but what you're finding is a lot more people uh, who aren't living uh, with a family of their own, they're particularly living with parents or other family members. Uh, so it's it's, taken a hit because, and I'll talk a little bit more with Gen Z in particular, these two generations are making up a lot of the jobs hardest hit by COVID. And so that you think about the um, impermeance of and the uh, stress and not really knowing what's happening that we all are feeling. Uh, but these in particular, because of where they're at, unless they've achieved kind of those milestones, uh, as we've you know seen over the years, when millennials kind of hit household income, you know, certain annual income around maybe 100,000 and start approaching that kind of upper level. They got married, they've had kids, they bought a house. They start trending much like previous generations. But any, any of the ones who haven't quite achieved those goals yet have definitely taken a hit and are more likely uh, pooling in with their uh, family. Uh, then you add in like the uh, lockdowns, obviously. The key here is that this is providing us a lot more people uh, clustered together, potentially back with their parents, uh, providing a lot more data on what they're doing online. So that also feeds into the data we talked about previously, uh, which I'll touch on again about content consumption. So when, I talk, when you talk about reaching folks, a lot of the conversations in, about reaching these generations, we do look at segmenting uh, by income, uh, depending where we're at, but also looking at how we can target based on interests, things they would be searching for, um, you know, whether it's financial assistance or things like that, there's a lot of ways to reach them. And because they're now 
uh, kind of clustering in homes, it's, it's basically adding to the pool of consumers giving off those signals. Gen Z, the uh, generation after, uh, much less purchasing power, but uh, still significant. Uh, but interestingly, 75% of a checking account, which is interesting. Uh, when asked last year and the year before, kind of 80% wanted to be home homeowners by age 30. Um, we're definitely geared towards, uh, you know, if they call the, gen the millennials, the uh, early adopters, uh, digital adopters, this generation is often referred to as digital natives uh, and, and the next generation gen alpha will be even more so where they're basically growing up not knowing a time when everything is digital. Very attuned towards uh, the tech giants and all the, the FinTech and things like that. Uh, robo advisors, really big, very popular. That was pre-pandemic. While that still may be a trend, as we look at the impact on this generation and this year, um, as we move to the next slide, uh, one of the things that really stood out is they are hardest hit in terms of they were most likely overrepresented in the services sector, uh, which was most at risk to being closed and reopened and closed and reopened during the pandemic. But also that reliance and that belief in fintechs and the digital uh, kind of world took a hit this year, uh, some of you know, uh, where some of those things were as the panic started to set in and people started to log in and try and get their money or move their money, there was actually shutdowns and lockdowns of crashes of, of sites. So the stability of the uh, traditional banking system, I think it feels like I got a stronger boost this year because I think it was a wake up call that while banks need to move more digitally and improve their online banking and digital tools, and we've all known that and we've all been working towards that, at the same time, the uh, the allure of the digital only world took a hit because at the end of the day, there's nothing physically there and try and they basically, this was the worst possible scenario test. So the advantage is we probably are looking at a lot of people who are going to be way more open than they were last year or the year before at hearing from banks, hearing what you have to say and that trust and the reliability. Um, I think there's definitely a lot that we can take advantage of to communicate with them and embrace them. Um, but also uh, this generation in particular is very big on knowing how brands are giving back, how are they not just taking care of um, their investors and their board and things like that, but they, they definitely signal out that they are very big on knowing that you're doing something to improve the world, improve the community, uh, environment, all those good things. But it's, it's definitely something that they're definitely going to be um, looking for help, much like small and medium businesses. And so they're, they're there waiting for us to help them. And right on their heels, Gen Alpha, obviously not a lot of data around this. And one of my uh, colleagues uh, actually recently had, had a child and it struck her that, oh my God, I've got a Gen Alpha. Uh, so it's, it's moving very quickly, but it's going to be interesting to see as this um, group grows up, what kind of role we're going to be uh, giving them as they turn into the banking customers of tomorrow. But they're coming and there's a lot of them. So just kind of putting that on radar. Uh, so as we kind of move through here, I mean, how many of you have actually uh, tried, uh, when we talk about Gen Y and, and Gen X, how many of you actually, uh, did we already do this one? Jill, how many have tried a streaming ad for the first time in 2020? I think we did. Oh. I'm sorry, did you ask me something, Robert? Yes, I, I thought perhaps we'd already done this question, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, oh, do the poll. Oh, did I do? That's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll just go. To, I, basically, I just want to know how many of you have tried the streaming ads this year. Uh, did we do that already? I don't think so. I don't think so. It was, it was similar last one. Yeah, just curious to see as we talk about uh, the last topic and this topic. Um, so 83%. Okay. Have not. Okay, cool. All right. Well, that was a lot of information, um, but we still got a little bit more to go. So I wanted to loop back really quick again, talking about the content consumption, because millennials and uh, Gen Z have started out from a place uh, looking last year where they were consuming a lot of content. Um, 
in, but the key thing here is not only num amount of content consumption, but this started, uh, not necessarily started with millennials, but they really moved this uh, scenario where multi-use application, meaning I've got a TV on, I'm on my tablet, I'm on my phone, I'm doing multitasking, I'm doing different things at the same time. And so one of the key things here is making sure that whatever strategy you're employing from a digital perspective, that you're employing a strategy that's taking into consideration where people's eyes are trending and what device they're using and when they're using it. So it's called known as a cross device strategy. So it's realization that people have multiple devices in their home from the connected TVs and the gaming consoles to their tablets and phones and desktops and laptops. So really being able to hone in on following the natural behavior when people go online, the things that they're normally doing uh, on the devices they're doing it and the potentially they're, they may be doing things at the same time uh, at the same time and being able to make sure that you've got a, a different device uh, that your ads are appearing in front of so that if this time when the ad appears, for example, on their phone, they might be looking at that while they've got a TV on, but next time they may be looking at the TV and ignoring their phone. So that's why it's important to kind of cross the campaign, uh, hit each of those devices. So this was sort of where they were before this year. And again, pulling this group out of the larger context that I shared in the previous uh, section around content consumption. On the next slide, there was a recent survey, I think it was August, July, uh, July of this year, looking at content consumption trends with these two generations specifically. So again, I'm not gonna read all the stuff on the left because it's kind of everything, everything, but I pulled out the specific section relating to content. And again, we can see watching more news coverage, both large jump uh, over previous, uh, you know, previous usage, watching more shows and films and streaming service, biggest jump there, and especially run Gen Z, watching more TV on broadcast channels, not quite as much. And again, not surprised uh, by that because of where people, we know people were watching content, the places they're choosing, and not surprisingly watching more videos, uh, such as like on YouTube or Vivo or things like that. So what you have, again, not just generally speaking, as I was talking before, with kind of all adults, uh, where that content consumption goes. When you're talking about finding Gen Z, Gen Y and Gen Z, and being meeting them kind of where they're at, they're downloading content, they're streaming content, and including news. So how do you leverage that knowledge and be able to find them and get in front of them with advertising possibilities? So again, it's kind of a conclusion to that uh, on the next slide. Really, what we're talking about is taking your brand to that next level. Uh, and I would also add in here like the emotional level that may be missing in some of the digital connections that we have uh, ongoing with consumers today. But especially with these two generations, having that visual content and interaction is extremely important because we want to target those the ones that are most receptive, taking into account a lot of what they're dealing with right now, but and basing that on their browsing and their buying behavior so that you can really speak to them when you know basically in their time when they're online on the devices that they're on and get your message in front of them so you can really complete that circle to buttress all of your marketing efforts so that was the uh, end of that so appreciate everybody's time going through that and we left time for questions so i'm happy to entertain any questions it looks like we've had a few questions come in, Robert. Okay. Um, they, one person asked, my footprint is mainly rural. Can I still do some online advertising? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we, as we talk to our clients, uh, we certainly have quite a few that have a footprint that extends into rural areas around the country. Uh, it really kind of depends. So part of this is kind of doing some analysis to see what's uh, available in your footprint, because obviously there have to be enough, you know, households in your footprint and people online so that we can get in front of them uh, and, and really speak to them digitally in the online perspective. So a lot of what we do is kind of take a you know, footprint analysis, if you will, digital footprint analysis to see uh, what's available. I'm very excited about, uh, although it's to some extent ruining astronomy, uh, the, the uh, digital satellites going up, 
Uh, they're clouding the skies with little uh, mini fake stars. But uh, other than that, the idea that high speed internet and access to that world is going to be expanding greatly over the next year plus, not just in the US, but around the world, but you know, speaking just in our zone, um, that's only going to open it up for more people to be able to access content that can't right now. Um, and when they access content, they give off those signals that allow us to see they're there and be able to interact with them. So um, certainly can't say it's a blanket works for everybody everywhere, uh, but we certainly have those conversations and there's certainly alternatives if it's not possible for whatever reason. Um, another one just came in. How do you think the younger generations decide where and how to open their first bank account? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say both of those generations from the research I've seen, one of the highest uh, things that they rely on is social proof. Uh, so it's a combination of word of mouth, family, friends, but they're very big, especially as, as they skew younger, very big uh, looking at reviews, peer reviews, peer comments. Uh, so it's, again, they use that social proof of uh, listening and, and looking at what people are saying about brands. So part of the overall brand management strategy has to be um, not just responding to reviews, for example, uh, but soliciting your current account holders to give you reviews or people that visit your branch or drive through following up with them because the more reviews that you get online that not only improves your ranking online for your locations but it also uh, addresses that research that they're going to do looking at what people are saying about you great answer thank you um we struggled to attribute account activity to our online advertising is it possible to do so? Yes, uh, that's probably one of the most asked questions we get. Uh, it is very difficult to attribute uh, exposure to ads down to account opening. And uh, that's been a challenge across all the different channels. Uh, and there's certainly different parts of the funnel. Uh, when we talk about uh, display advertising and video advertising and things like that, we're talking top of funnel, um, lesser intent versus maybe paid search or paid social when you got kind of lower funnel high intent so they're all part of that spectrum of getting somebody to that point of making a decision and so one of the exciting things has been uh, over the last few years and this year particularly uh, we've seen a lot of great success because of how you approach digital advertising and depending on the data that you have access to being able to attribute that kind of before and after look and be able, if you're able to determine that you know people have been exposed to ads and then tie them back to the account activity that the banks have on their side, you can start to draw a line from the exposure to action and then quantify that and come back and really start to have for the first time a really decent way to say, I spent this, I did this, as a result, we achieved this, which, you know, it's, it's nice to have the, the impressions and the clicks and things like that, that, you know, are kind of basic metrics, uh, similar to email marketing, but being able to take um, that extra level down because of the way the data is available today, uh, it, it becomes possible to start linking the two, but it all, as always, it comes down to the data. Let's see. What is the benefit of digital advertising versus the paid search ads? Oh, gotcha. I, I touched on that a little bit. So if you think of paid search and paid social, the kind of lower funnel, high intent, you're catching people when they're close to or about to, they're on the verge of making a decision. So they've already kind of done research. They've kind of narrowed it down. They're at the kind of end of the road. They're about, you're trying to catch them right before they take an action that may be with someone else. When we talk about uh, online advertising, uh, display, video, it's upper funnel, it's lower intent, but the idea is that you're catching them when they're just starting to research, just starting to probe and look around. They're just starting to give off those signals of interest that in, in some cases on a big brother level, they may be giving off subconscious signals of intent. They don't even know that they're starting down that path, but all that data allows us to use the online advertising upper funnel to start influencing them down towards a specific brand, meaning ABC Bank, 
versus DEF Bank. So we want to try and influence them one way or the other towards your brands and making that decision that they're going to go with you or at least explore you. So you've got an opportunity to win their business. So it's really, if you think about it, they're a perfect complement because one, you're catching them before it's too late, but the other one, you start building out a flow where you're catching people earlier in the game, have more time to work with them, more time to influence them and taken together, they really fill out that whole, that whole decision-making spectrum. Thank you. Wow, I do not see any additional questions. Um, you know, Robert, I, I have to say, um, I think your kids are lucky. You're pretty hip dad and all this digital stuff, so. Well, they're, they're fur babies, so they, they, okay. uh, I think they're lucky. Yeah, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what they would say, but. <laughs> well, um, I thank, thank you, you all, Harlan Clark, very much. Um, Robert, that just some vast information that is so invaluable. Thank you. Um, if any questions come up after the fact, I know that Robert, uh, Sharon Ann would be more than happy to have further discussions with you. Absolutely. You, you do not have to be working with Harlan Clark currently to reach out with questions. Um, you know, they can still help you in, in these digital aspects, even if you're not with Harlan for checks. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you all for your time today. Um, happy holidays. Happy holidays. And take care. Thank you so much for having us. Thank Stay you. Stay safe, everyone. Take care.